you have been helping to educate girls, bo- girls and boys, but primarily looking at how you can educate more girls and women in Afghanistan. And you started that work in 2018 when the Taliban sort of started to come back into power. You were how old when you moved to Pakistan? I was born in 97. So I was born in Pakistan. So by that time, my family was already there for like almost a decade and a half. It was sort of a transition time where people sort of knew what was happening in Afghanistan, but also turned a blind eye on it because at the end of 97, people don't really care. They have recently murdered an Afghan president. The Taliban have imposed their like, you know, decrees and policies and bans. And then there's this huge surge of refugees who are now not coming into Pakistan because of the conflict. They're coming because of the Taliban's bans and decrees. So one thing I like to talk about and acknowledge a lot is um, the refugees started in the 80s in 81, but they sort of continued even in the 90s and mid 90s and in, end of 90s, just because uh, there were no opportunities for women and girls and those who cared about their kids did leave Afghanistan. And your dad was an educator, right? I mean, he was a tribal leader, but he also really valued education. A year or two after I'm born, he was told by the UN agencies and everyone that, oh, like you guys are a smaller group a smaller village and we cannot make a school here so you girls should just walk to the next village if they are so interested in education and everything <laughs> my dad was so curious he's like you know what we're gonna do it on our own and it's so funny i still make fun of him for that like i talked to my mom and i'm like he just went on the whole day and he just opened a school in a lawn so he was like you know what we're gonna volunteer so he literally made his sister teach and uh, made my mom teach He taught himself, I remember, it was a school that was made just because we knew how important education is. And there was no, oh, you need to send your daughters to school and talk about that. No, it was like, oh, we made a school. Now the girls need to come. Well, so I read that your family motto was that you can go hungry, but you can't go without learning. You can't go a day without learning. Yeah. My dad didn't care what grades you got. My dad didn't care um, what your teachers thought of you. My dad did care about the one thing that was like learning and be motivated about it and sort of get excited when you learn something, you know. In my early teenage, I was sent to like another city to continue learning. And that's like first time when I started seeing the discrimination and what happens with Afghan refugees and how they're treated. Um, It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you come from. Um, As long as the word Afghan is like you know next to you or your name or the way your accent is or the way your parents dress or your father dresses or you dress it sort of is seen as like a very low class sort of thing and people look down on you and you're discriminated i was discriminated by teachers students everyone and i think that was sort of my moment where it was like i cannot stay in a country that is going to do this to me and so you launched learn that was in 2018 right yes learn sort of came into this place when I met my cousin for the first time when I was in Afghanistan in Kandahar and the first interaction I had with my own blood and family was um, me meeting my cousin and she's like, um, you know, I learned too. And I'm like, oh, that is so nice. And my hair is like, okay, probably there are schools in this country, in this district, you know, and she's like, no, I don't. Her niece and her nephew came every uh, Thursdays and Fridays and would teach her everything. And then she would repeat it until next Friday. And I was like, oh okay and i was so intrigued and i was like i'm gonna like you know let's let's do something let's get you into a school we get her into school and then she calls me in a week and she's like i cannot do this i don't want to go to school I'm like how dare you I'm like i'm so furious I'm like how dare you but then when i talked to her i understood that she was not welcomed in that school because she was a kid who had learned on her own she didn't know how to manage time she didn't know how to interact with other students and she didn't even know how to learn at that pace where teacher is teaching you. And that sort of like triggered the whole learn thing. And I was like, I went to my dad, I was like, I need money. I need money. You need to give me money, loan it to me. I'm going to pay you back. But I need to start a nonprofit that focuses on girls' education and boys' education from rural and tribal regions. And he's like, okay, <laughs> you give me the money. In terms of sort of strategy, one of the other things that I think is really brilliant, honestly, that you guys have done is to go to the older men in the villages and explain to them why this is important. But there were things that we did because we knew it was important and should be done. Um, 
And I knew that firsthand looking at how it was done. So for me, it was very easy to connect with them on that level. Yes, I might have been a kid. I might have uh, been like naive, you know, and I might have been a woman and young girl. But the one thing that I had was I knew where they were coming from and I knew how I was going to talk to them. Every time I went, I sat with them and I ate with them. And even if there were times where they didn't agree with me, they still respected it. And they would understand, okay, she's not here to do a project or like, you know, um, make money off of these kids and make herself a job. She is invested in this. And I think people like them can see through you. Like they know if you're invested or not. And I think anybody can who has intuitions, you know. So that was the sort of building a force between us and uh, any elder, any religious, cultural, tribal leader. All of them understood that we were invested in uplifting the community rather than us becoming the heroes in their community. And so when you're going into these rural areas, which are enemy controlled areas. I mean, these are not like, they're not super psyched to have somebody come in and teach girls. There are a few things about Afghanistan that like it's in the background, but we don't highlight it. The first thing is nothing is stopping Afghans from educating their daughters. And I will give you the whole logic behind it. The first thing is we have been at war for more than 40 years. We have buried so many young men, so many of them and so many young women. You really want a moment of peace for yourself. And that's what Afghans are in right now. It's not that they don't they don't want to send their daughters to school. It's just they are so exhausted with the constant fighting that at this point they don't have any it in them to fight further, you know. But even with that, um to this day, um there are fathers who show up with the teachers that teach in our schools. There are fathers who show up with their daughters who's learning our school, and there are fathers who are still texting us um, to open a school in their community, and there are girls who are doing that. What happened after 2001, and how that changed the way that you had to operate? For me, I think the more strategic point was like, we're gonna take back power, this power that these 70,000 men are holding, and we're gonna take it in a way where they cannot hold it back inside buildings anymore. Because the school is a building, and for them to close those doors was they're sort of showing us power. And for me, I was like, oh, you're going to close an infrastructural place. I'm going to open a space that is not accessible by you or not, what do we say, it's controlled by you. So we didn't only go with like physical spaces and talk to communities and all like send your daughters to school because it's important. No. Communities came to us. They were like, oh, we're invested in doing this. And I was like, how invested are you? How invested are we talking? And they're like, very. <laughs> so like, okay, you're going to provide us with the space. You're going to provide us with the safety. We are not. And we're going to provide you with teacher salaries, with laptops, with internet, with anything and everything you're going to need to educate your daughter. That's my commitment to you, that your daughter is going to get graduated from grade 12. They're going to have those diplomas and transcripts and they're going to go places. And your commitment to me is you're going to protect your daughters who are going to teach and daughters who are going to learn. And you're going to do it with your own uh, commitment. You're not going to expect me to do this for you. Education is opportunity, right? Like I like to say that education is the one gift that no one can take away from you. But what if girls aren't allowed to work? How does that play out in terms of your plan? My plan is not to restrict them into staying in Afghanistan or uh, force them into going because either way I'm going to be either perpetuating into limiting their opportunities or uh, uh, involved in brain drain and I don't want to be part of either. There are going to be people who are going to stay and there are going to be people who want to leave. For me, the personal goal would be that, yes, I'm predicting more digital literacy, more learning online, offline, microbytes, satellite learning, radio learning, whatever. But I'm also shifting towards earning goals, which is like, oh, you can earn with becoming an assistant, but you can also earn becoming a CEO in remotely. You can work with these. When you educate people, you allow them to think for themselves and you, you give them opportunities for jobs and all kinds of other things. But that's all just a part of this ability to be autonomous. Yes. And to understand that you have rights and you have dignity, right? And you can chart your own course and you don't have to defer to an authority yes. on something just because that's what you were told to do. You can think for yourself. 
Yes. What happened when your rep- representative went in to like renew a license or something and they sort of demanded to speak with you? These sort of things happen all the time. Two weeks ago, I was in this interview where this guy was like, oh, but is the women's problem the only problem that we have in this oh, Afghanistan? What about other problems? And I was like, yes, women are your only problem because you're 50% of the country and you have banned us from everything. I mean, it's just another day, another man who thinks he's better than you and he who thinks just because he won the war, he's entitled to do whatever he wants, you know. 